Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host for tonight, Geraldine Dew. Good evening and welcome to the 1990 Ethnic Business of the Year Awards. Now, whether you're watching on SBS or you're here in Melbourne's elegant Hyatt on Collins, I hope you'll enjoy our entertainment and our awards presentation tonight. And no, I haven't left the ABC. I'm not a casualty of the cuts, at least not so far anyway, not as of this morning. Nothing, you can't be sure of anything in my industry though. It's a bit like the odd building society, isn't it? Never the odd back. <laughs> We'd never say that. Now, I think this is an example, I suppose, of the cooperation that is possible between our two national broadcasters. It's terrific to have been invited by SBS to compare tonight, and I'm very grateful that the ABC has said yes. And I'm here tonight partly because I'm Irish. After all, we are this country's original ethnics, and some of us have done very well indeed by our forebears' decision to uh, make that journey from the old country to this new one. Now, it is an awards night, so you know uh, partly what uh, to expect of certain former rituals like this. Be prepared, though, for some marvellous stories that have been collected by the National Australia Bank, the sponsors and organisers of the Ethnic Business of the Year Awards. I think you will be genuinely moved by some of the tales of the people you'll meet tonight, people who have adapted in quite breathtaking ways and who've absolutely drawn the best out of both themselves and Australia. There's some really heartening stories. Now, this is the only business award of its kind. It's created especially for high achievers in the migrant business community, and it's open to all business people who have come here from any non-English speaking background. The creator of the award and the sole sponsor is the National Australia Bank, and so it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce to you its managing director, Mr. Nobby Clark. <laughs> Well, thank you, Geraldine, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All aspects of life in Australia have been considerably enhanced by immigration. Tonight, we recognise the special contribution to business by ethnic communities. National Australia Bank is proud to support the Ethnic Business of the Year Award, and once again, to acknowledge the achievements of many fine individuals and families. Right now, business conditions in Australia are as tough as I can remember them. Yet, with undiminished enthusiasm, newcomers to our country continue to build worthwhile business enterprises. For most, it is a struggle. On the top of the normal problems encountered in establishing new business, migrants must adjust to a new land, a new culture, and in many cases, a new language. That takes courage, enterprise, and unremitting work. It is hardly surprising, then, that some of them fail. What is truly remarkable is the number that do succeed. Some of those success stories will be recounted this evening. Although the economic cost of immigration is being quested by some people in Australia, we must remember the great contribution migrants have made and are making to Australia's national wealth. Migrants have added vigour, diversity and creativity to our economy. Perhaps these qualities are difficult to quantify, but they are real and they are needed, more so now than at any previous time in our history. Selecting this year's finalists and ultimate winners from the many worthy nominations has been a daunting task. On behalf of the bank, and I'm sure all of you, my sincerest thanks to our judges, who are Sir Nicholas Shahadi, Ms. Carla Sampati, Ms. Eve Malab, Dr. Peter Chan, Dr. Hung Win, and Mr. Tony Timberu.
My special thanks also to our consultant on the Ethnic Business Awards, Mr. Joseph Asaf of Ethnic Communications, and of course to SBS Television for tonight's telecast. My best wishes and good luck to all finalists and to all those participants who did not make the finals. And now back to Geraldine to introduce our first finalists in this, the 1990 Ethnic Business of the Year Awards. Thanks, Nobby. Now, I'd like to just explain a little bit about the structure of these awards. Finalists have been chosen from three zones, really. New South Wales, which includes the ACT, Queensland, which includes the Northern Territory, and Victoria, Tasmania. Other states may possibly be involved in the future. There are three entry categories. First, for businesses established in Australia for less than five years. The second, for businesses established here for more than five years. And finally, for a business started or brought to Australia at any time under the federal government's business migration program. Each category state finalist uh, selected to join us here tonight at the Hyatt receives an award certificate plus a $1,000 cash prize. Now from each category, one overall winner will be selected by the judges to win a further cash prize of $5,000 plus an impressive crystal trophy. Now of course, in all entries, the judges were looking for bless their hearts, I don't know how they did it, qualities of excellence, success and endeavour. And I think you'll see it in large measure. So now, on to the most important part of tonight's proceedings. Our first New South Wales finalist in Category 1, Byung Yul Chong, who's originally from Korea, is a true example of someone who dreams of making the desert bloom. Now, in this case, it was a piece of Australian wasteland, a six-hectare weed-infested block on the outskirts of Sydney. Mr Chong saw its potential, and over the last five years, and due to some genuinely back-breaking effort, he and his family have transformed it. Look carefully when you next visit the market. Many of the exotic vegetables there are a tribute to this man's tenacity, his ability to survive flood and devastation twice, and to his marketing skills. people uh, have a, a little bit different sort of uh, vegetables and uh, because of the Mr. Zhang's endeavor, we are having some nice good quality of vegetables and uh, the New South Wales government selected his farm as the largest oriental vegetable farms in Australia. oriental vegetables like Chinese cabbages and oriental lettuce, radishes, especially red chilies. On Korean tables, the red chilies are a must for making a kimchi, which is very famous uh, worldwide, I think. He is giving some contribution to Australian primary industry, and uh, I think uh, it should be recognized and encouraged. The world. I never holidayed one day the five year time. Just all my family and me always in the farm.
Mr. Byung Yul Chong, whose family still lives in a caravan on the site, by the way. Now, a Category 1 finalist from Queensland. <clears throat> this is indeed a multicultural entry. Mr. Walter Hung came to Australia from Brazil, though he's of Chinese parentage. And when he settled in Townsville, Walter realised that there was a need for Asian specialty foods and goods. So just a year ago, he and his wife set up the Chung Hua Asian Food and Gifts Imports Company. They supply the city with a wide range of giftware and delicacies that could create an entire yum cha. And it comes with a charming lesson in Asian custom and tradition. So it's a genuine cultural exchange. the flea markets with fresh grown vegetables, homemade egg noodles and homemade soybean curd and we noticed that the people were really into these types of food so we decided to open our shop near our main central shopping area. to stop the decorations because people like something different to beautify their homes and also good luck charms. I find what is particularly interesting is that there is 60% men, Australian men coming into the shop that like to be adventurous in the kitchen by cooking Chinese, Malaysian, Indian food. we like to develop a workshop which we can make prepared homemade foods and also develop other food lines at the same time. Mr. Walter Hung and his wife, Mi Lin Hung. Coincidentally, our Victorian Category 1 finalist is also involved in the food industry, but in quite a different sense. Ernst Stuller was born in Austria, and he's lived, to quote the cliche, one of those rich tapestries of lives. He started out as an army cook, but he has ended up with us here tonight as one of only four Australian holders of the prestigious Black Hat Chef Awards. What makes him special, I think, apart from his talent, is the amount of energy he's given back to his adopted country. In 1980, for instance, he captained the multi-medal award-winning Australian Culinary Olympics team. But it was just four years ago that he and his wife, Gail, really let their heads go and bought themselves a small Glen Waverley cake shop. All the rest is history. Long, long hours and effort later, the patisserie business is now a huge cake and pastry wholesale factory. And when you see Ernst's delicious cakes, just try to imagine him as an army cook. And when I did come to Australia, uh, firstly I started up in Eltham Barrel as a German restaurant. So I, it gave me time to study the industry here in Australia to see what's cooking here, you see. But in a restaurant business, you're limited to yourself. You work hard, but you can't grow. You sit so many people and that's it. 
and after seven years I decided to go into a cake shop business. I felt it needs someone in that industry to supply the restaurants because I had problem when I was in a restaurant uh, to get good quality cakes because in the kitchen like our kitchen we had you're not equipped to make for making cakes so I thought it needs something there to supply the industry and that was actually the idea As it happened then uh, you have to buy a little truck and uh, you know start to supply and my wife she did all the deliveries Sunday mornings you know three o'clock she had to get up and do the deliveries I started at midnight to do all the Danish and croissants and uh, that's how we started out to go into uh, wholesaling <laughs> Mr. Ernst Stuller, he could probably ski well too. The man has no ends. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, join me in congratulating all our Category 1 finalists, please. <laughs> now, this program is about achievement, quite obviously. Some people have that rare quality to achieve and entertain at the same time. Take our next guest, for instance. On stage and television, in recordings and cabaret, drama, comedy or musicals, she has excelled and she's entertained consistently. She's undoubtedly one of Australia's finest entertainers. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Colleen Hewitt. <laughs>
Thank you, Colleen Hewitt. And now to category two. Remember that in this category, all finalists have established businesses for more than five years. So let's now prepare to meet the New South Wales ACT finalist, Sergio Bonassi of Aquabike International. It's a family company based in the Canberra suburb of Fishwick. Now, the Bonassis developed this novel water sport after migrating here. On the Italian Riviera, they had built and hired conventional pedal boats for many years. Coming to Australia inspired them to bigger and brighter things. And the ultra-safe aquabike aqua is certainly bigger and brighter. Even Disneyland has them, apparently. Now, that wonderful word export applies in a very big way to aquabikes and to their sister products, which are flown to now 38 countries. <laughs> Over the years, people kept on, kept on asking my father and myself uh, for different type of craft, something different, something more modern, more unusual than paddle boats, which have been around for years and years. And my father one day came up with this idea. Reliable, which is a very simple this designs that we have now. It's very simple and very easy to assemble in any country in the world with sub uh, or semi skilled staff. And maintenance is just basic oiling and adjusting the chain once a week, once a month. It's for people of all ages. Certainly, the younger people love them because they are more colourful than pedal boats. They're more fun, there's more movement, more action. And all the people love them because they're just so relaxing. You paddle very gently and go and have a very pleasant, quiet ride. There's no noise, no pollution. In Australia, we've taken over more than 80% of the market. Overseas, we've only so far been able to capture 1%. We estimate a market of 100,000 units, and we feel we can easily capture 20, 30% of that market. It is the best craft in the industry, the most colourful, and there's nothing like it in the world. In the future, we are looking at other crafts, but it's, we are very limited by the power of our legs, what we can achieve and what we can do. Sergio Bonassi. The Category 2 finalist from Queensland was born in Argentina. Robert Scarcheri is a Brisbane-based cabinet maker whose business had quite humble beginnings, just him alone in a workshop underneath his mother's house. It's quite an optimistic tale, actually, for all you home carpenters out there. In nine short years, Robert mixed his woodwork skills with determination, with some clear goals, with very much the help of his family and a good bunch of staff. From these ingredients, he built a sturdy company that's particularly known for its quick response to market demand. Today, there are 23 employees in Robert's company with a wide range of prestigious commercial projects. I 
was happy to get the apprenticeship in, in Cabin Joining because I always loved the, the wood workmanship and uh, that was something I was always aiming for. Quality is a very important part of every business and um, I, I was very lucky to learn my train with a very professional person that whatever uh, roots he had, he sort of gave it to me. The key to success is the determine of quality, they always got to push, you know, assist on that equality. And um, your service is very important to the, the success of today. I've been on the game for a few years now, uh, as a, in the building game. I always, um, hoping to extend to my maximum all my business that I have now, uh, a way of making it more successful every year. But also I love to have my own building company. Robert Scarcari. Now some people have that happy knack of being clever business people and at the same time brilliant with people in their workplace I mean. Quite frankly it doesn't happen very often. But our Victorian finalist in category two, Antonino Scavello, is one such person. He's the managing director of Scavello Commercial Interiors and his is a multicultural, in many, multicultural company in many ways. Its staff have come from all over the globe and there are no barriers of race, status or wealth. It does really seem to be one big, happy and successful family of more than 550 employees now, Australia-wide. Their specialty is office design, which is now a big and respected part of the construction industry. It's a very sophisticated craft designing modern offices these days. And Antonino seems to inspire tremendous loyalty from his staff. Despite all the pressures of expansion, they've always kept that sense of working together. An example set and maintained by Antonino Scavallo. produce and install partitions, uh, workstations, furniture, but uh, we work to architects' specification, whatever they design, we produce. We uh, mainly, uh, like especially in Germany, uh, in here we, uh, in Australia, uh, mainly the, uh, the office becomes very fashionable and, uh, and it's designer's choice and uh, the designers, they're the one that they design architectural fitment and we produce to whatever the sound they want. like to 
uh, say that you get out what you put in and uh, you really have to work hard for it. success to succeed. Uh, nothing comes from nothing. Antonino Scavello. And of course, may all those wonderful companies continue to thrive and prosper. Victorian audiences in particular will be familiar with our next guest. He is a singer with numerous television and live appearances to his name. And around the best jazz venues, he's just known as Big Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinctive sound of Bob Valentine. <laughs> Let's fly, let's fly away If you can use some exotic booze There's a bar in far Bombay Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away Come fly with me, let's float down to Peru In Lama Land, there's a one-man band, and he'll to his flute for you. Come fly with me, let's float up in the blue. Once I get you up there, where the air is rarefied, we'll just glide. Starry eyed, once I get you up there, I'll be holding you so near. You may hear angels cheer, cause we're together. Weather wise, it's such a lovely day. Yes, just say the word. And we'll beat the birds down at Acapulco Bay. Yeah. It's perfect for a flying honeymoon, they say. Come fly with me, let's fly. Once I get you up there, ooh, where the air is rarefied, we'll just glide. Starry eyed, once I get you up there, I'll be holding you. Just say the words and we'll beat the birds down to Acapulco Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect for a flying honeymoon, they say. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly. Valentine, I just said to Nobby Clark while I was standing over there with him, I would never have the courage to get up there and sing like that. He said, I wouldn't even have the courage to put on the suit. <laughs> so, just a little insight into one of our top businessmen. Many of you may, may not have heard of the 
Business Migration Program, which our next set of awards highlights. It was set up by the federal government specifically to attract people with proven business flair to Australia. Now, I hesitate to use the word entrepreneur because it's a bit on the nose these days, but uh, in its true sense, of course, it describes people who see possibilities where others don't and then have the drive to carry them through. Our Category 3 finalists all have that in abundance, as you'll soon see. They're all genuine producers too, which a lot of the better known entrepreneurs certainly aren't. In return, they say they get back a lot of benefits the rest of us take for granted about Australia. Political stability, a relaxed lifestyle, and some sense that it really is worth having a go here. So, now to our first finalist in this category, Category 3. Marblo Holdings is the name of the creation of Dr. Karim Obaidi, an engineer and businessman originally from Iraq. What he's done is very cleverly to replicate nature. Luckily for us, in 1984, he was encouraged to migrate to Australia under the Business Migration Program. Now, he brought with him the technology and the skills to create stone-like materials for use in the building industry. They're actually synthetic marble. They're light, durable, inexpensive, and they're easily molded into a myriad of shapes. They call it Marblo. It's being successfully exported to many countries through the licensing and selling of the Marblo formula and technology. Marblo as a product is not only solid surface material, but it started as solid surface material as it is now. It's a non-porous material, solid, non-laminated. It's replacing many different products in the market like laminated sheets, wood, and other products. Also, Marblo as a solid surface material itself, it is a non-porous material, non-laminated. It lasts long, it has got high uh, heat resistance, uh, chemical resistance, stain resistance. So it's better than a traditional uh, available material. Marble can be fabricated much easier than other products. It can be sanded, jointed unobtrusively, uh, due to the special glue which Marblo has developed. It has involved high pressure mold injection technique. It has a stress relief program technique which is a new thing no one has ever applied to plastic. And it has uh, developed many other techniques which is still new and we are trying to develop it into more, other, uh, into more applications. We have moved from manufacturing into international licensing. And we started by selling our technology for this local area uh, to ICI, which covers Australia, New Zealand, and many different countries in the Pacific Basin. The second step was by selling our technology to Japan through Shawa Shell. The third one and fourth and fifth one is in Europe, USA, and the Middle East. I can see the future of Marblo is growing very fast. We started as a little Australian company. Now we are going into a big international company through our licensing and our deals with big international companies through the world. I can see also uh, Marble Future growing more and more where we put new products as a result of our research and development center. Dr. Karim Obaidi. Now, have you ever heard of a place in Queensland called Ningi? Well, I hadn't, I have to admit, till today. But now I know it's a prime site for delicious prawns. Our Queensland finalist is Lux Enterprises, a prawn hatchery. Jesse and Francis Lin and their children migrated to Australia from Taiwan in 1988, bringing with them machinery, technology, expertise, determination, and a large investment. All, all necessary components for setting up a prawn breeding business, which will just put many of us off. 
In Taiwan, the Lins had been exporters of prawns to the USA and Japan. Here, their impressive company growth has advanced plans to resume exporting, this time with Australia being the big winner. The Lins have been very generous too in sharing their knowledge and high quality prawn larvae with uh, prawn farmers and the Department of Primary Industry. Again, Australia reaps the reward. what we call Taiwan technology. It is a form of new technology in growing prawns. They're researching the brown tiger prawn, which ultimately will result in a magnificent export for the Australian prawn industry. And uh, they have already export markets with their Taiwan company. Okay. They currently export to the States and to Japan. <laughs> developing um, an industry here that has had uh, an enormous um, lack of success. Many of these businesses have gone to the wall, um, but this is not going to happen with Francis and Jesse Lin because of their, their new approach and their commitment to it and their preparedness to work within, um, within the Queensland DPI structure. Agriculture is very important because you can't just uh, catch everything, every animal from ocean. They will destroy the nature, you see. And if we develop agriculture, which they can have plenty of seafood to eat for the next generation, for the environment, we, don't, we, we should develop agriculture. Jesse and Francis Lin. Our Victorian finalist, Watson Chang, has been in Australia for only four years. When he migrated here from Taiwan, he brought with him some key ingredients. He brought a vision of Australia's potential to export goods it now imports, and he brought vital contacts in the markets he'd left. Using technology, courage and investment, he's built AW Spinning Mills, a high technology yarn manufacturing plant in just two years. Watson Chang's dream has grown into a business that now employs around 50 people. It's about to manufacture polyester cotton yarns to many local customers and he has plans to export to overseas markets. <laughs> For business, we cannot afford to take too much risk. So it has to be one of the business we are familiar with. Textile special spinning is the one area I'm very familiar with.
in the old days, spinning industry was a labor-intensive industry, but not today. Then after running, when we increase the capacity and the achieve the technical standards we want to achieve, finally we are going to aim for international competitive. In that time, we'll be able to export. Watson Chang, and congratulations to each of the finalists in the Business Migration Program category. You do wonder why we don't hear more about this, don't you? It's a great story. Well, as I warned you, we would uh, meet some extremely resourceful people tonight. Basically, I suppose they all just had the knack of finding that market niche here in Australia and adding uh, just a fair bit of courage and determination, which turned some clever ideas into commercial propositions. In a moment, we will know uh, who each category winner is, but first, a special award. And to present that award, I'd like you to welcome a very special guest, the Federal Minister for Local Government and the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women, the Honourable Wendy Phaeton. <laughs> The Australian Government, through the Office of Multicultural Affairs, is very pleased to be associated with these awards. Events of this kind emphasise the vital economic dimension of multiculturalism outlined in the Government's national agenda for a multicultural Australia. Tonight is evidence that Australia's development rests with maintaining and marketing the skills and abilities of all Australians, regardless of background. That's an Australian tradition. After all, our immigrants have always been the key to building this nation through their creativity, entrepreneurship and sheer hard work. These talents enhance Australia's export potential, creating new employment opportunities for all Australians. I would like to congratulate not only the award winners, but also the Australian National Bank for raising public awareness of the substantial contribution that immigrants make to the Australian economy and the major benefits they bestow. I also congratulate SBS Television for bringing the event live to Australians throughout the country. So many of the entrants impressed the judges with stories of their inventiveness. Of these, National Australia Bank has selected one very promising young business to be the recipient of the 1990 Office of Multicultural Affairs Encouragement Award. Our OMA Encouragement Award winner tonight left Greece four years ago. He was, he was observant enough to see that there was a need for locally made security roller shutters and about 18 months ago he began manufacturing. The security roller shutter company is very young but shows great potential. Tonight's Encouragement Award winner is Alex Peppers. Alex Peppers came to Australia four years ago determined to make a mark in his new country. It wasn't long before he saw an opportunity. Security shutters are very common in Europe but until a few years ago were almost unknown in Australia. 
Alex formed Modern Europe Security Rollo Shutters and began making, marketing and installing his own product based on the European model. His background as a mechanical engineer in Greece helped him adapt the European design to suit the Australian climate. He discovered that PVC was more suitable to the Australian conditions than aluminium, so he imported the slats from Italy and began production. The marketing breakthrough came when he designed a new locking system for the shutters, which significantly increased the security factor. The business has grown from what began as a home-based operation to a factory and showroom in the Melbourne suburb of Sunshine, covering 300 square metres. Alex is now exploring the possibility of expanding to other Victorian centres and possibly interstate. And he admits that he's got a few more products in mind once his shutters are firmly established on the market. Congratulations, Alex Peppers, and uh, also thank you to you, uh, Wendy Faton, for being part of our presentation. Congratulations, of course, to all our state finalists tonight. Uh, right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the clever country we're told we must become. Now, we are going to keep you uh, in suspense just a little longer, I'm, I'm afraid, not my idea, others. And I can't think of a better reason for this uh, than to listen to Colleen Hewitt once more, who's going to sing for us. Some years ago, by the way, Colleen made our next song a huge hit. It's a beautiful song, and hers is a great version. So tonight we are lucky to welcome Colleen once more to sing for us The Wind, Betweeth, <laughs> the wind Beneath My Wings. Must have been cold there in my shadow to never have sunlight on your face. You've been content to let me shine. You always walked a step behind. I was the one with all the glory While you were the one with all the strength Only a face without a name I never once heard you complain
my way You are the wind beneath my way It's just great, Colleen. Thanks very much indeed. It's a terrific version of it. Now, I'm becoming aware of quite a lot of rumblings of anticipation around me. I think there's a genuine suspense because we are about, in a moment, to find out just which of our nine state finalists will be national award winners tonight. Now, remember, uh, one national winner for each of the three categories. And here to announce the names of all the winners, Mr Nobby Clark in his usual suit. <laughs> Well, thank you, Geraldine. Category one. And the winner is... Ann Stuller. I don't know what to say. I'm surprised. I, d I don't know where to start. I would like to thank my wife, especially my wife, for all her help, because without her, I couldn't have made it. Uh, Ray Regan, my accountant, for advised me to get everything right. <laughs> and uh, Ray not to build me a nice factory. And especially, the uh, National Australian Bank, because without their help, I couldn't have done anything. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. We have now category two, and the winner is Antonina Scavello. <laughs> nervous. Um, I'd like to thank the National Australian Bank for providing this award. I'd like to thank the jury and everyone associated for this. Finally, i also like to thank my wife, my brother, my staff, that without them this would never have been possible. Right. Thank you all. <laughs> And last but not least, category three, and the winner is Dr. Karim Abadi. I'd like to thank the National Australia Bank for initiating this uh, clever and very brave idea. I hope it will put in front of the Australian government few samples or examples of what uh, properly planned uh, migration could bring to this country. I would like to thank uh, all the people who have supported me in my project and finally thank my wife who was very patient with me. Thank you.
congratulations to Ernst Antonino and Dr. Karim Obadi. And our apologies, Antonino, because we didn't give you your, your uh, statuette. You now have it. <laughs> And incidentally, I just thought one little thing I might make the point. Um, uh, you don't have to be a National Australia Bank customer, incidentally, to become an entrant for this award. <laughs> I've seen proof that there are other banks represented. Uh, so uh, I think that just might uh, make things a bit clearer. Well, I think that uh, this really uh, is a marvellous night. It, it always uh, astonishes me, in a way, that Australians seem to find it so hard to be openly optimistic about this nation's collective future while in their own lives they'll tell you that they're thoroughly hopeful. It's a little contradiction that I can never quite understand. And I suppose the thing about tonight's awards is that they really do give you permission to be hopeful and to be optimistic. And if you are naturally so, as I am, it's rather, it's rather nice. I think the thing they do is that they epitomise the worth of dreams, because when dreams do come true, and if people put effort in, they do, they can invariably succeed beyond all expectations, as we've seen. It's good to know, too, that the National Australia Bank has such a strong commitment to supporting these dreamers as they turn us into, well, I would think it's pretty obvious, a vastly more competitive nation. And so we end the 1990 Ethnic Business of the Year Awards presentation, which I hope as well serves as a symbolic welcome to all our migrant brothers and sisters. I have very much enjoyed being here to share this exciting good uh, evening. Good night now, and thank you for watching.